Um, no, I was just saying these uh, overnight three years. Uh, yeah. Just want a bit of background to how you went from, I think, writing angry letters to... Uh, uh, just one angry letter. Um, I was working in the bookshop and I was um, <coughs> selling magazines about comics and one of them was very bad and it was so bad in the end that I got drunk one night and wrote them a letter explaining why they were shit. <laughs> And the editor of another comics magazine got in touch saying, I liked your letter. <laughs> Can I pay you to write for us? And, you know, I stopped reading at pay you. <laughs> um, so I did uh, journalism for this magazine, Speakeasy, for a while, which had been bought by John Brand Publishing. That's where their money was coming from. And John Brand Publishing were the people who published Viz. Do you guys know Viz, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> Back in the 80s, Viz, back in the 80s, how old do I sound, Jesus? Back in the 80s, Viz was selling more than a million copies a month, or every two months. Uh, there was a lot of money around. I wrote for Speakeasy for a while, and the people at John Brown obviously just decided, well, we had too much money. Let's do um, a crisis-style uh, adult comics anthology. Uh, all of the others have failed, like I said, too much money. Um, and, and the editor of Speakeasy said, well, they've just made me the editor of this new comic. Uh, if you think you're so fucking clever, why don't you write us a comic instead of just reviewing them for us? My first thought was, well, you were paying me to review them. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's not like I was foisting them on you or anything. Um, and I wrote up a pitch, which was Lazarus Churchyard, mm. which they bought. And I proceeded to... Well, actually, starved worse because I lost my job in the bookshop around the same time, so I was living off that for a while. And then, of course, that got cancelled after seven issues because the market wasn't ready for all the adult-oriented comics anthologies that were in print at the time. There was Crisis, there was Revolver, there was Strip. Uh, there were at least one or two others <coughs> coming out of the Fleetway House. But there were only 20,000 people who were really interested. Um and you divide that audience by all these magazines coming out, and no one was really earning enough to buy a sandwich. <coughs> Dave Elliott, who had been partially behind uh, the magazine at John Brown, Dave Elliott had this long career of falling on his feet everywhere. He would get fired from one place, and he'd say, that's all right, I've already got another job to go to. And he just hopped through the industry over like 15 years. And he hopped from John Brown to Tundra UK. There was a publishing company operated by Kevin Eastman who co-created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So he had more money than God and slept on a bed of golden vaginas every night. <laughs> <coughs> and money was just pouring out of every orifice in his body. And he thought, oh, I might as well do something with this. Let's launch my own comics company and just throw it all away. <coughs> so Dave brought me up to Tundra UK, I did some comics over there, Lazarus Churchyard, I did some more Lazarus Churchyard, uh, I did a couple of other things, and then the bottom fell out of that, by which point Dave Elliott, I think, had already jumped to like Dark Horse or Penthouse. Interchangeable, really. Yeah, um, and they collapsed just as I'd invoiced them. I'd actually just moved into my girlfriend, moved in with my girlfriend, we'd just gotten a flat. And they refused to honour my last invoice. Nice. No money at all. No prospect of work. And then I got a phone call from dear old Archie Goodwin from DC Comics in the States. I'd met him 18 months previously and he, sends, he said, send me a pitch. And I did and I never heard anything again. I forgot all about it. And literally we were like down to our last £10 between us. Archie Goodwin phoned up saying, I've just seen this pitch you sent me. Can I buy it? <laughs> and that was it. Archie Goodwin was a major, major figure in American comics. If Archie commissioned your first work, um, then you were golden. Um, he brought in people like James Robinson. Um, so he, he had that, that reputation and that touch. And from there, Marvel called me. I had a friend at Marvel who tried to get me in and there was no luck. And then I got this phone call saying, we just heard Archie hired you for something. Can we hire you for something? <laughs> uh, and that 
is where I actually started earning a living. What was your pitch for DC? Uh, it was two issues of Legends of the Dark Knight, uh, which Archie was editing, uh, which was, uh, it was a Batman series, but it was all multi-part stories that would then be packaged off into graphic novels. So there was a lot of churn. There was a new team every two to five issues. So he would buy a lot of pitches. He bought so many pitches that, in fact, when he died, they went through his files and discovered they didn't actually need to buy another pitch for that book for the next five to six years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you worked for Marvel, you started off on them. Was that um, Hellstorm, was it? Or? Um, um, what's the first? first thing I did for Marvel was something for an Akira tribute book. And then it was either Hellstorm or it was City, for si City of Silence, which I did for Epic, and then Epic collapsed. It was one or the other. Hellstorm was the first mainstream Marvel book at any point. If I remember correctly, um, I think it was Hellstorm that you used to get uh, letters from Christians giving out about saying we buy a reissue and we hate it. Damn it, I got this letter from these two brothers whose address was somewhere up a hill. <laughs> <laughs> and then the state. <laughs> um, and the letter read, Your comic makes us hurl. <laughs> We buy it every month. Were they backed up or something? Huh? Were they backed up? <laughs> um, but that, that's the thing that um, a lot of your work, well, not a lot of your work, but uh, it seems to you've got quite a reputation as not being so much offensive as slightly caustic, shall we say. And <laughs> that's as polite as I can You're put. being polite because I'm sitting right here, right? Yeah, behind your back, God, it'd be different. But um, they're like. Um, there's been certain times, I imagine, where that attitude has kind of got you problems. Like, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of shoot. <laughs> which, which I'm not sure is a touchy subject, but it was... Uh... Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting... <coughs> shoot, um... I don't know how many people who are actually hardcore comics fans and how many people have just wandered in here because it's dry. Um, <laughs> it's a comic called Hellblazer. It was made into a film called Constant Time with Keanu Reeves. Yay! <laughs> I can hear the trauma from here. <laughs> and I wrote it for a while. And I wrote an episode called Shoot uh, that was about schoolyard slangs in the United States. And everyone really liked it. And the PR person at the time, PR person at the time went crazy over it. And she was going to send it out to all these mainstream media outlets. And then Columbine happened like two, three weeks before we were due to go to press. So we were very, very close to printing. <coughs> um, but Patty, bless her, decided this didn't matter and she was going to send it to the New York Times and God only knows what else. And she created such a, a stir about it that Paul Levitz, who run DC at the time, came into the office and said, hey, I hear Warren's written an interesting issue of Hellblazer, can I read it? Julie gave him a copy and he hit the roof. He said, we can't publish this. Um, Columbine's just happened and it's about kids killing each other and, you know, there's no moral or anything. It's just kids killing each other. <laughs> because they like to do that. <laughs> um, Is that not the problem? Not time? quite what I wrote, but, you know. Um, and we went round and round uh, for weeks on this. And I like Paul personally. Uh, but one of, Paul trait, one of Paul's traits is the more he, you have arguments presented to him, the more intransigent he will get. So it got to the point where it was either going to be edited down to the level of an episode of Scooby-Doo, <laughs> or it wasn't going to be printed, or they were just going to rewrite it and stick my name on it anyway. And it got to the point where I said, don't publish it. I don't want you to release it with my name on it. If you're going to do, it to, do that to it, don't publish it. And by the way, I quit. Because if you're not going to stand behind what I write, then what's the fucking point? And in any case... Well, no. No, seriously. No, in any case, I mean, they own this. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not their principle to stand, because they own this character. It's, a similar situation would be if I was working for Disney and I wrote an animated film in which Minnie Mouse was a crack whore. <laughs> if they refuse to put that out, that's not really censorship because they own it, you know.
<laughs> they have the right to say no to that. Although lots and lots of people will go and see that. 